Okay, so welcome everyone to this uh, independent dialogue uh, organized for the Food Systems Summit 2021 by the UN. Um, so this dialogue uh, is uh, organized by many organizations and we have uh, uh, very inspiring speakers, uh, which we will introduce to you very shortly. Uh, my name is Sofia Cavalleri. I'm a, a joint PhD candidate uh, at the Stockholm Environment Institute and uh, Chulalongkorn University. And uh, I am co-convening this with uh, Pavini and uh, Alice. I will let you guys introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Pavini. I'm a student at UC Berkeley studying environmental conservation and resource studies. Um, and I'm also the co-founder of an organization that I just started here called Chipco Asia um, that tries to create a community and a platform that can spread knowledge, tools, and products that can help people around Southeast Asia and Asia particularly to live more sustainably because sometimes the content we get, you know, in our social media feed is relevant for the Western hemisphere, but we really try to like provide content that's relevant for this region. So I'm really excited to be here and co-convening this um, workshop. Thank you. And hi everyone, I'm Alice and I work for Siani, which is a networks-based communications platforms dedicated to food security and agricultural development. And in our work, we promote multi-sector dialogue and action around sustainable agriculture for food security. And I'm very happy to co-convene this event. Thank you. Okay, great. And uh, also, I, I think you guys saw it, but this event is being uh, recorded just for your information. Um, so I guess we can start with a little bit of background uh, on the sustainable food systems uh, and Pavini, you can go ahead and then I can follow. All right, thank you. So, you know, I want to just start with giving a brief introduction about why food is so important. I'm sure everyone here probably knows but um, other than the fact that food satisfies all of our cravings, the chocolate at midnight, the cheese, the salad bowl, food is so much more than many of us conceptualize it to be. Food is our fuel, food provides us medicine, food is culture, and food is identity. So there's really no question about why food is so important. And I think many of us here are aware of that. And for this reason, the food systems that are in place that allow us to get food on our plates every day is also a really important conversation uh, that is a really important thing that we have to talk about. Because while like we have done really big wonders for our food system now, it's incredible that we're having a food system that's able to feed the majority of our population. That was unimaginable, you know, in the hunter gatherer days. We've really come to develop our, our food systems to, to be able to do this. But there's still some concerns and um, some concerns and you know facts that we have to um, address um, about our food systems. So right now, like around the world, more than enough food is produced to feed everyone, but still like around 80, 800 million people still go hungry. And a big part of that's because one third of the food that we're produced is getting wasted. So there's clearly an inefficiency there. And now with the COVID crisis and climate change exacerbating, we're seeing like rising levels of hunger. After a steady progress we've made, we're seeing rising levels of hunger. Over like 150 million people have gone hungry additionally in the last year because of these things. Um, and now 10% of the global population is affected by hunger. So while we have developed our food system a lot, there's still a long way to go to make it really equitable, sustainable, and resilient in the face of climate change, in the face of pandemics. And so that's why it's really important to have this conversation about how we can make our systems better and more resilient and sustainable for the future. And I'll let Sophia dive a bit deeper into the technicalities of what a food system is and what we mean by high tech and low tech. Yes, thank you, Pav. 
So I guess uh, I guess um, just to round it up because it's already an introduction and we want to dive deeper into each side and with our speakers. Uh, when we talk about food systems, it's very complex because we consider the whole chain, right? Uh, and we go from the production to the distribution, the logistics, uh, the consumption and the waste. Uh, so when we talk about food system, it becomes uh, um, often uh, an approach that has been conceptualized uh, in the literature review uh, as uh, high tech or low tech solutions. And this is what we wanted to explore today with this uh, uh, conversation. Today we wanted to explore uh, what are, what do we mean by low-tech solutions, what do we mean by high-tech solutions, and also um, are these uh, sides, um, do, we, do we talk about them as uh, uh, sides that we need uh, uh, to take, uh, or actually it's something that can be incorporated and integrated. Um, so I guess uh, uh, we can uh, move to our speakers um, and just uh, ask them uh, to briefly present themselves. Uh, so maybe we can start with Rohan and uh, yeah, just to let you know, to, to know what you're doing a bit more and uh, who are you, what's your background? Uh, you are on mute. <laughs> Uh, uh, in the context of this conversation, uh, we started an indoor farming company about a bit less than one year ago here in Bangkok. So the aim was to cut down on, um, one is like uh, PhD emissions on food transport. So the main thing is imported food. So instead of growing stuff in Australia or Europe or anywhere else, we want to try and grow it locally, uh, especially in Bangkok. Um, so what we've it's been a very long uh, learning process, but we've managed to um, grow like some cold weather crops in Bangkok, right in the heart of the city. And in doing so, like with Happy Grocers uh, Mo's team, they've been able to cut from throwing away 80% of like the KO that they used to get from Chiang Mai, which isn't too far away, down to about 5% wastage. So we've seen like a, a real impact already with what we've been doing. So our plan is just to continue in um, development and work on different, um, more low temperature crops that are very popular within Bangkok and just keep trying to grow things locally instead of importing them. So, yeah. Okay, great. Um, moving on to Mon, maybe you want to take uh, the, the research side, a bit more visibility to the research side. Okay, so um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so um, I have a background in food science and I have uh, several years of experience in multinational food companies, but I'm currently working in the university solving problem in manufacturing site. Um, these uh, producer are actually Thai company that made a lot of food to export to the market like Europe, Asia, Americas. So even though they operate in Thailand, they have to be compliant to all the regulation around the globe. So most of the work that we do is uh, reducing waste, improving efficiency, and try to, you know, um, make the plant to be able to produce food as much and in time as possible. So um, that's where I'm from. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Mo, uh, something from the social entrepreneurship kind of world? Hi, everybody. My name is Mo. I'm the co-founder of Happy Grocers. So what we do is essentially we are a grocery store that basically um, source our products from farmers that do sustainable agriculture and uh, farm square is included. And also, basically, we want to be a choice for people to be able to shop in a way that they can instantly make impact by not contributing to food waste or not contributing to plastic waste. And also making sure that we have as many choices as possible for people to be able to shop locally. And uh, yeah, so the whole idea is basically to create enough demand for people who would like sustainable products so that we can empower our farmers to grow thing in a more organic and sustainable way. Great, thanks. And uh, finally, uh, Melissa, 
uh, who is joining us from the Philippines. Hello everyone, my name is Melissa Alamang, but you can call me Mel. So I'm working as the program coordinator for our policy advocacy unit of Pakisama. So Pakisama is a national confederation of family farmer organization here in the Philippines. So we are focused with empowering our farmers, fishers, uh, IPs, women and youth. And lastly, I am the coordinator of Pamanaka. So I think we have the same engagement with Sophia. That's why I'm here. So we have we have attended a webinar focusing on the role and situation of youth. So we organized the Pamanaka. So what is my role here? So basically, I'm working with the policy advocacy unit to ensure uh, enabling policy environment for our family farmers here in the Philippines. At the same time, to provide concrete support to our smallholder farmers. So currently, I'm also um, assisting our farmers in their engagement in this food system summit at the same time working on the UN Decade of Family Farming Philippine Action Plan. So thank you for the invite and I would like to share our experiences here. Thank you. Okay, great to have all of you here and we are very excited to move forward. Okay, so for today, I guess we wanted to know your opinions uh, and uh, from your stories, from your experiences, uh, since you come from very different backgrounds, uh, um, about this uh, conceptual fight uh, that has been going on between low tech, high tech, uh, which solutions are the best solutions, uh, and if there are any good practices uh, that you have encountered uh, in the past. Uh, so the round one of this uh, kind of conceptual fight would be more towards a socioeconomic impact. Uh, so my question for all the speakers, and I invite you to just jump in if you have any, any ideas and you can talk about them and then someone else can integrate, uh, is um, uh, what are the best solutions that we found uh, in terms of the socioeconomic uh, uh, benefits uh, to communities, uh, to cities? Uh, uh, solutions that act, can actually uh, create jobs uh, uh, and can actually create a sustainable uh, social economic development. Can I go first? Sure. Okay, sure. So um, actually, I think I can share about one of the ideas that or stories that inspired the whole concept of happy groceries. So last year we started because of the COVID just because people couldn't find a way to buy vegetable without um, creating plastic waste or they want to support local farmers. So we just like connect these two together. But as we did more and more research with our farmers, I got to sit down with a farmer who is a rice farmer in uh, a province that's about two hours away from Bangkok. And then he was telling me that um, he has been growing organic rice for like quite a while, like years, and uh, he had to sell it in the same price as a chemical one. So then I was like, why? Because in Bangkok, like organic rice is much more expensive than the chemical ones. And then he said that it's because he rely on the market within the community and his neighbors. And in order for him to stay competitive in the market, he has to make the same price as other people. Otherwise, he wouldn't be able to sell. So one thing I learned from that is that first, like the access to market is such an important thing for, for farmers to be able to be paid accordingly to how much work they put in. And also the second thing I've learned is that the price of the rice is actually set by a government agency that sit in the aircon room and never actually put in the hours of work that farmers invest in because they only calculate like how much fertilizer they put in, how much all the equipment would cost for, let's say like one harvest of rice. And then I was just like, so that experience kind of inspired to look into more of what would be some of the way for us to, to ensure that our farmers would have access to the market. So they get paid for what they actually work for and how to actually educate customers enough to be able for, for them to be able to make a decision in a way that would actually create impact as well, because in Thailand, food is really cheap, right? And people are really used to that. So I think that experience kind of taught us that in order to develop like the economy within the region, it's also really important to 
kind of discover where the farmers are as well and meet them where they are because the average age of farmers in Thailand are 60 years old and not everybody knows how to use the internet or how to actually sell things on Facebook. And I feel like beside the methodology of farming itself, I think it's also really important to connect or meet the farmers where they are and then connect them to the market as well. And I also believe that as we are doing this, more and more young people would see that agriculture is actually really cool and maybe they go back home and there's, there's more chance for farmers to connect to the market directly without us ha actually having to like go to the mountains and like meet them where they are, you know? And uh, yeah, so in short, what I'm trying to say is that I think the access to market is really, really crucially important for us to, to develop the local economy. Yes, totally. Uh, does anyone want to respond to that? Sophia. Yes. I think I can um, back up. <laughs> I think what Mo just shared on, I mean, they are also advocates of organic farming. So I would just like to share the experience of our organization since we are really a confederation of family farmer organization here in the Philippines. I think I would like to share our um, experience on the IDOPS. So IDOPS is the Integrated Diversified Organic Farming System. So this is the technology uh, applied mostly of our family farmer members. At the same time, on the policy level, since we are advocating for sustainable farming, for organic farming, we need a concrete policy framework. So we are also pushing uh, to legislate uh, to, I, mean, I will just share later. So first, about integrated diversified organic farming system. So in this context, we don't need to really have the advanced technology that, that can be sometimes the preparedness of our farmers and preparedness and access in terms of technology. But with IDOVs, um, all the available resources in the community, they can utilize that, that and make that as organic fertilizer. So since we are dealing with a uh, smallholder family farmers, so... I mean, the, the, the capacity to produce their own food, subsistence farming, at the same time, their ability to organize. So organize in a form of um, association or cooperative, so product consolidation. So since we empower them in a form of advocacy, in a form of business, so really IDOPS, really, uh, I mean, a technology that is something we really promote in practice. So what are the in interventions that we are dealing with that we are doing at and we are doing is first the i mean the capacity building the capacity we need to capacitate our farmers why do we need to shift from conventional to organic farming what are the advantages of resorting to organic farming of course i mean due to limited resources we can just command our farmers oh you need to shift from organic farming we need there's also this mindset that organic farming means costly production no we need to, to change the mindset to capacitate them, how to make them, I mean, I mean to innovate, to be resourceful on their available resources in their and in their community. So the technology and application of IDOPS, we have the capacity capacity trainings, the applications, the study tours. So we have the demo farms. So farmers are uh, sharing their experiences. So what are the crops that are, I mean, have potential in markets? What are the, I mean, the variety of rice that, that they can share with other members? So lastly, in terms of policy, so in last 2020, 2010, in the Philippines, we have uh, legislated the Organic Agriculture Act of 2010, and it was amended uh, last December 20. Uh, December 2020. So it aims to promote and develop the organic agriculture here in the Philippines. So uh, it since it's an amended act, so it makes the I mean certification of organic products to small farmers and fisher folks more accessible. So we don't need uh, third party certification, costly and making our pro products organic. So I mean. There's really, there are many things that needs to be done, but in terms of, uh, I mean, how to make this more um, economic and nature, nature, I mean, economic, viable and nature friendly. So 
it's an ongoing um, initiatives of pakisama with our family farmer members. I think that's all I can share for now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, great. Uh, Rohan or Mon? I was just thinking um, what Mo said makes a lot of sense. And I think where technology can meet the conventional is about giving that access um, to the market, to the, the farmers, because that's what they're missing at the moment. Like it seems that people are putting in a lot, a lot of work and have been for a long time, but it's just, it's the market doesn't know it's there. And I think that's something that Happy Grocers have done well is they've managed to connect the market that exists to the farmers that also exist. Whereas before they just, there was nothing in the middle. But I think that's a good application of the technology with the conventional methods. Um, I think uh, I think regarding to what Mo said uh, in terms of organic standard in Thailand, I don't think there is a a set. I I believe there is some registration, but I don't know how much people are actually following it. So I think it's good that we will have um, you know a tool for them to get access to all this information. So uh, this this may be just somewhat related, but um, one other thing that we do a lot with manufacturer when we work with them is we actually try to improve the skill of people um, who work on the ground floor. So we we try to train them on different skill that they can keep up to the trend of the food production or the trend of the food system of where it's going. And I think that same concept can be applied here with conventional farmers. I understand that some of them might be a bit older and it might be hard for them to learn like a typical way of learning. So what we can do is we can try to use technology to make a creative learning method for them to actually pick up um, more information regarding how can they put the value add on their actual products. Can I add? Yes. Do you yeah, because yeah. like if you, if for example, if you have like a really easy phone app um, to just learn the definition of organic and to just learn, okay, if you do one, two, three, you will be labeled this. If you do one, two, five, you can label your product this way. Then they can instantly realize that they may already be at the very high value on their product without, without before, like they, they wouldn't be sure about it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with what Kun, Kun Mon said. Um, like, I think accessibility of the knowledge of the agriculture process is also really, really important. Um, and uh, something that I have discovered through my research with my farmers is also that like access to knowledge also has to come with a support within the community as well, because there's like, there's like a learning curve in Thai farmer where they have to go through a stage of how people in the whole community would call them crazy. And if they can get yeah. over that, then would they would be like enlightened and then like really ready to fight on whatever it takes to become organic farmers. Like for example, um, a, one of the team member that we have, PA, he he started this whole organic uh, movement in, in Payao like about four years ago. It started off with 15 people, but after five years, there are only four to five people who who actually like really like working on it and and really are succeeding. Um, I think another thing that I want to add about how I think like natural and traditional way of farming can use technology to really make sure that things are really like reliable is that because I I can see that Kun like Bo Ripad was asking in the chat about what is the the regulation regarding organic farming in Thailand and stuff, right? I I feel like even the the certifications in Thailand itself, there are a lot of controversy regarding whether it's actually reliable or not, or the process of actually inspecting it, because there are certificates that you can just certified by each other within the community or people that you know. Sometimes you pay more and then you get certified, and um, I personally think that, I mean, I'm totally for like back to the basic agriculture, permaculture and all this stuff. And I think one thing that we can really use technology to help us 
become more confident with our food supply chain is if we use blockchain, for example, and really are like if we can really be confident that whatever information that we can find about our food is actually true from the source, then I think that's even more effective or more important than whatever certificate that we have, right? Because certification only rely on farmers putting things down in papers. And sometimes they just do it after 15 days that they already have done certain activities. And sometimes they do not tell the truth because they forget. Um, so I think the traditional practice can really use the help of technology to make consumers more confident about the products. And I think the communities that would have the most trust from the customers could also be really competitive in the market as well. Totally. Yes. Um, is it, is it a quick uh, jump in, Mon? Um, no, uh, I think I think it's just a good point that she 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 brought up uh, blockchain, just because it's an up and coming trend in the what we call the Internet of Food categories. So basically, we use a blockchain technology into the tracing traceability of food, either it's a freshness of fish or the origination of certain food of whether it's actually come from the place they claim it's come from. Um, so those technology are being developed in the research space right now. Um, not that the one that I've seen in Thailand, but I saw, I saw cases that was done in the fish market in Australia. So they, they would trace the fish right from the fish market until getting to the consumer to trace for freshness, um, quality, of course, and you know uh, the temperature profile when the fish move from Australia to wherever it goes to. So that's just an example of the technology side and for sure like with organic farming um i believe that this can come in very handy yes for sure and i think this is a very good link to our next uh, round that pavini is gonna lead yeah i love that discussion um and how like we can really see how technology and uh high-tech solutions and low-tech solutions can work together and so now we've talked a bit about um, the socioeconomic impact side. I want to just uh, steer our way to environmental impacts. So, you know, I think a lot of us are aware that uh, right now our food systems from food production to packaging to transportation to consumption has a huge environmental footprint. Um, I made this infographic a while ago and it does show some really uh, starking facts about the impact of our food production currently. It's accounting for around 30% of our greenhouse gas emissions, around 80% of global deforestation, and it's creating a lot of waste that produces even more greenhouse gas emissions like methane and, and so on. So as we can see, it's having a huge environmental impact. And if we continue this business as usual, um, it might not be sustainable in the future because from research we know that we have to produce around 70% more food to make enough more food for the amount of people that will be there in 2050. And to keep in mind, our, this whole system is more vulnerable to climate change and pandemics which are expected to get worse. So I just wanted to uh, open the floor to discussions about how you know some low-tech uh, indigenous knowledge and techniques uh, can contribute to creating a food system that is sustainable and resilient and what does high-tech um, technology technological solution have to offer in this realm as well does anyone want to start 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 off i'm happy to start if i'm not muted this time um this is a discussion that i think me and mo have had many many times um about like we specialize in hydroponics and the reason behind that is it's used a lot less water and a lot less space to produce more food. So I, it's, it's not applicable for every type of um, agriculture, especially not like livestock and things like that, but it can be incorporated. So I've seen um, some companies around the world where they're starting to produce food stock for livestock using like very intensive, like, um, well, space intensive uh, indoor farming systems so it's 
these like the fodder grows very fast. Um, within seven days, they've got enough to start like feeding the livestock. So I think a lot of these like more high tech um, solutions can mix in with other parts of traditional agriculture where they're, they're, these kind of solutions don't exist. Um, like when it comes to like leafy greens and other vegetables, you can use hydroponics instead of out in the field. And I don't think it's like, a, it's not a replacement for traditional agriculture. It's an improvement on traditional agriculture. And here in Thailand, like I know it rains a lot, but we still have drought, especially in certain regions. So I think water conservation and uh, space con conservation are two very important factors that we need to consider. So the more that we can incorporate, like, hydroponics not new, it's been around for a very, very long time, but um, maybe some people don't understand it fully or uh, they don't see the benefits. I think if you can work with farmers and show them the benefits compared to like the conventional just crops in the ground agriculture, I think the people will start um, using it more and more. Yeah, actually, um, to add on to that, I totally agree with Robin that uh, it's really important to understand the nature of your crop and choose the practice that that work well with that certain crop, right? And like you said, we have been fighting it like so many times regarding that. Actually, right, with my farmers, um, when I asked my organic farmers about hydroponics, they just instantly kind of like, it's like a, a two, like two separate group of people even like because in Thailand a lot of people understood hydroponics as organic so then when they say it oh I have been eating organic but then when we really ask people where they get the products from then they, they end up saying it's hydroponics and then organic farmers would be like that's not organic and they tend to fight with each other all the time about this um but but yeah i think i think it's also like because for example happy grocer we we deal with about uh, 170 products and a lot of products are like some of them are like leafy greens which work really well when it comes to hydroponics like kale for example but we also have to eat with products that are uh different like potato or or a mango and stuff like that and we really have to look into the kind of um, practice that makes sense, both to make sure that we get high quality products and also also have minimal impact on the environment as well. And I think I think at the end of the day, is is really it's really about like balancing and like diversifying the practice accordingly to what our um, crop needs. I think. Yeah, those are some great points. Um, I like how you're talking about diversifying the crops and using different techniques that are relevant for different types of crops, because I think we can agree that there's no one solution um, for all. Um, Mon and Melissa, would you like to add anything to that conversation, discussion? I think yeah, I can, sure. I, sorry, sorry. Go, Mon. Oh, no, no. Go ahead. Please go ahead. It's OK. Melissa, you can go ahead. All right. I think when it, when it, when we talk about the environmental impact here, we have the context here in the Philippines that uh, we are bombarded around 20 to 26 typhoons a year. So it's really a challenge for us how to make our farmers resilient. So we have the ongoing challenge on climate change. We have the ongoing challenge of, I mean, onslaught of natural phenomena. At the same time, this current pandemic that hinders, uh, that hinders and provide bar barriers to our farmers. So I mean, last year we have we have been distracted uh, around two three consecutive typhoons that really wipe out the farmlands of our farmers. So in terms of environmental impact, how this technology, I mean, the question is how we can make this um, technology. Uh, for the farmers, to, for them to become resilient. I mean, when we talk about the food systems, I mean, I'm coming from the perspective of the producers, the smallholder farmers, they are the producers, they are in the forefront of everything that we have in the table. So what we are having in 
going in our table is comes from the I mean from the sacrifices from the efforts of our uh, farmers. So as a response, so like what I have mentioned a while ago, there should be a complementary um, complementary initiatives in terms of advancing for the policies at the same time, concrete support mechanisms. So how to make our farmers resilient? They need to be, I mean, when we talk about technology, technology is some, it's not something they can be afraid of. I mean, form of empowerment to our farmers in how to make that technology. I mean, technology and making them resilient, accessible, nature-friendly. At the same time, it don't compensate any of their, I mean, traditional way of farming in terms of our IPs and their tradition, indigenous way of farming. And at the same time, um, I mean, since we are dealing mostly with this ongoing challenge, the climate change, we have the technology, well, like what I have mentioned, the IDOP. So what are the ways, what are the technologies under that? The seed banking, community seed banking, the, I mean, the community resilience, or it has the component of being um, environmental friendly and other, I mean, other steps. If the farmer shifts to organic farming, there should be a farm planning. I mean, farm resource assessment at the same time, integration of the crops, diver diversification. So um, let us look back who are the really the who are the who are the frontliners here in the food production system. So I mean, uh, let us make that technology accessible to our uh, to our farmers. So I think we came from different different background, but at the same time, we have, we are the end consumers, the cons we, are, we are the end, I mean, users, the consumers, but we, we need to capacitate our producers. So I think that's all I can share for now. Mon, did you want to no, add? Um, yeah, um, actually, what I, what I was thinking about is because you mentioned the food loss, that we happen in the production um, of 30% of food produced globally is actually waste or loss during the process. So I look up some interesting paper and what I see is, um, and this can be good for everyone here to, to, to see, is um, actually we lost a lot in the consumption storage, which means we went to the market, we already buy you know vegetable or meat and then we come home, but we didn't use them right away. And then it just go bad in our refrigerators. So um, I, I feel like with this, like, and, and there's actually a drastic difference between the developing countries and developed country in terms of losses. You see a lot more losses in developed countries, interesting enough. So I think it's it come back to like the mindset of consumer as well, of like when you go out and you buy food, um, are you being aware and are you being mindful of how much food you actually need in one purchases and um, the knowledge of how long does different type of food last. And I think this basic knowledge sometimes is not readily available to, to like consumer or it's not readily ingrained in some of the cultures. And, and that's why we see a lot of food losses. I mean, here we can throw in so many technology, new packaging technology or, you know, tracing or whatever. But if you still buy food and you don't eat them, those food are still going into the 30% food loss that we see in the statistic. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I think it was very interesting and it tied very well. The environmental and social parts are very interconnected, uh, as we've seen. Uh, I saw a lot of questions in the chat and I saw that Body Path before I had uh, raised the hand. So, Body Path, if you want to go ahead and ask uh, the question that you had or make any comments, or if anyone wants to jump in, you can raise your hand and maybe ask oh, okay hello i'm 
sorry, Pat. Um, I, I think Mo, thank, thank you very much, Mo, for answering um, my questions in the chat. I think Mo answered most of my questions so far. Uh, I, I might have some more later. I don't want to take up too much time, but yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So then I guess we can jump to this question, uh, which was the main uh, final question of this uh, whole uh, uh, discussion that we want to have. So how can we integrate the low tech and the high tech solutions that we've presented and we've uh, uh, discussed today in order to redesign a more sustainable, resilient and inclusive food system for the future? Um, and I've heard a lot of inspiring things about uh, access uh, that is missing, uh, access to knowledge, uh, access to information, access to markets and marketing, uh, um, and also how to make uh, how to use blockchain how to use this technology uh, not only for social purposes but also for environmental um, benefits uh, so in order to understand what impacts uh, we are creating on the environment and at what stage of the food system uh, so yeah i would like to hear from all speakers on this matter of the integration Can I go first? Sure. Yeah. So um, I've been exploring this like <laughs> on the daily basis <laughs> because we always trying to think of some of the ways to actually like revolutionize our food system in Thailand, right? And um, a lot of things that I have discovered throughout my journey is um, either our farmers say that, oh, we, you know, we can make like absolute organic products, but like, where do we sell? And at the same time, we always hear customers say, oh, it's so hard to find absolute organic products in Thailand. And there's such a huge connection, like disconnection between these two. What happens in, in the Thai market right now is that whoever has the most convenient way to do logistics or um, application for people to order easily or have the capital to invest in a lot of marketing would be the one who gets the share of the market, right? And this person or this company would be able to influence the way farmers do farming, right? And most of the time, these companies don't do sustainable farming. And I've seen from my experience that what would inspire our farmers to become organic or whatever practice that we think would be environmental friendly would actually be the demand from the market. So I think that in order to integrate like technology into sustainable farming, I think it would have to come also from the market. Like for example, if we have a market that connect um, to farmers who are doing uh, organic farming, let's say, that have efficient logistics, that have um, good marketing and have an easy way for people to come and shop for the product. And once we have enough demand for this, then that would determine what farmers would plan and the process that they would practice. And I think then we can, yeah, because I think there's already a lot of technology that would support the farming itself, but then not a lot of the market specifically for sustainable agriculture. So but, uh, I personally feel like we could integrate technology from um, by creating a market that's convenient for customers to buy. Yes. I think one of the other, other challenges is also like the average age of the farmers here, as Mo said, is 60. So they, they don't know how to create that marketplace or access the market because, you know, most people are buying online or you know, promoting through social media. So without that knowledge and without the younger people involved, uh, you're always going to have a bit of a struggle. So I, I think not just in Thailand, but internationally, a problem is like, how do you make farming sexy for younger people to come into the, <laughs> come into the, I guess, the industry? And um, it's something that we're all trying to do, trying in our long-term plan is trying to attract young people uh, into like urban farming, because it's, it's a little bit different. Like they're not working out in the field. They're not getting a tan. They can be indoors. It can be a nice, cool environment. You know, the lights look good. Um, so I, I think that's part of the challenge as well, attracting the youth into farming because, you know, farmers work their whole life. They send their kids to university and the kids don't want to go back to work in the field. 
and you know, it's definitely not just a Thai problem. It's a problem in Australia too, uh, in Malaysia, anywhere else. Um, so I think we need to, the more technology is integrated into farming or into food production, I guess the better, the more appealing it is for young people. Sure. Any other take um, on that? No, I have actually, I have a question for, for Mo. Um, do like for 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 the rice farmer and the organic like label do do we actually have a law or a test that you have to go through to be able to label rice as organic um yeah usually like the farmers that i know and a lot of places that that would require certification they would require either organic thailand certification or dap certification um, so DAP is actually by the government and they have certain standards for, let's say, like not using chemicals um, two weeks before the harvest to make sure that there's a minimal amount of chemicals in the product, which we call safe grade. And it's so weak. And I feel like, I feel like, okay, this is my like personal <laughs> criticism. I feel like all these um certification at the end of the day they are designed to 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 get people certified right and then they get money so like with the model itself i'm not like an absolute believer of certifications and that's the reason why i think that blockchain can be the solution to this um but maybe i'm i'm gonna be waiting for your university to to finish that research and i'm for sure gonna be using that research <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I think like labeling wise, because because we are dealing with Thailand and that's why it's it's natural for you to feel like certificate are out to get money. But like, mm -hmm. for example, for the uh, for the US FDA, usually when they do organic labeling, they do actually a proper testing of like trace chemical in the rice and um, Hopefully for them, it's it, it's harder to get you know bribing label or you know all of the questionable action happen to go on the label. So no, I just I just want to understand the the Thai context of this organic labeling because going mm -hmm. back to your point on the market and you know try to make people try to make sustainable farming to have people like to for people to demand more of it is because a local would probably feel like, why do I have to pay for organic when I can't trust the label? Um, mm -hmm. Like, you know, I can't tell the difference or so on and so forth. And like you said, um, whichever company have a better influencer, have like more money to do that, um, they will in turn influence the actual farming and we don't want that, right? Because because we want standard to come from a respectable organization and not just some for-profit company, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, no, no, I just tried to understand. And and I was just wondering whether is there anything we can do, but from what I'm hearing from you, it, it can be challenging for Thailand. So we might have to find other solution. Yeah, what yeah. I also have observed is it's, the case is really similar to, to Melissa in the Philippines where mm -hmm. uh, like small farmers, they might not be able to afford to even get certified, right? And right. as I'm talking to customers in many parts of Thailand, people in Bangkok would want to see more of the certification as opposed to people who buy direct from the farmers because they actually go see that farm anytime that they that they want, right? And then they they trust the farmers. They really see the practice, and I think yeah. I think certification probably would be only for people who who are a little distant from right. from the source of food. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No. No. I'm, yeah. No. I just try to try to think of like as a consumer as well, like of buying organic product. Like, what would I use to decide whether this is trustworthy sources of organic product or not? Yeah. So I think yeah, for Thailand, the certification might not mean as much, just because of how dubious it is, like the process of getting it. Mm -hmm. um, sadly, yeah. We should talk after this. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, it would be, you know, it would be interesting because like if we can have tracing, if we can have records of you know whatever chemicals goes into the plant, um, you can probably use that profile itself to be your marketing tools to actually confirm that the rice is organic or whatnot. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. For sure, it's an interesting conversation it could be a, a webinar on itself <laughs> um i'm gonna ask Bodipat to quickly jump in i see the hand up and uh, ask a question and then we're gonna move to melissa for final remarks yes thank you sophia i just had a quick question and maybe it's already the answer may be already obvious but when we talk about low tech versus high tech I i'm still wondering about the definitions on how and what we mean by that for example, when I think of low tech agriculture, I think of um, subsistence farming, for example, like in, to use an agriculture example, maybe uh, uh, integrated rice, uh, rice shrimp farming in Vietnam and Cambodia. And when I think of high tech, I think of um, uh, high density salmon farming in Norway or something like that, where they use sensors, automatic feeding, you know, that kind of thing. So I'm just wondering um, what are the uh, people's perspectives on low tech and high tech? Uh, when we talk about the, those two definitions. Sure, very conceptual question. Thank you. Um, Melissa, do you wanna have a take on that uh, and uh, maybe build on that also to talk about the integration of both? Yeah, actually I I would like to share about how to integrate the low-tech and high-tech solution. So, I mean, some of the re recommendations before I answer the, uh, the question of our colleague, no. Uh, first, how to integrate solutions is identify the, the problems. So coming from the perspective of the food producer, what are the challenges currently faced by our farmers, land security, access to farming techniques and methodologies, the climate change, the ongoing pandemic at the same time, uh, we have the high production costs but low selling price. At the same time, we have this... Uh, problem on the aging um, population of farmers in the Philippines, land conversation, land grabbing. So that's our, I mean, it's, it, it, it's the problem behind the scene on how we achieve this sustainable food system. So identify the, identify the problems. At the same time, we need to synergize our efforts. So we are dealing with the UN uh, Food System Summit. So we have been participated, we have participated a lot of I mean, uh, national, regional, and global consultations. So might as well all the results uh, at the same time of uh, all of the results of this, of that um, consultation must be, I mean, developed in the concrete development framework. And at the same time, like our, our dialogue right now, so some of the key perspectives coming from, I mean, we have came from different backgrounds. At the same time, aside from the Food System Summit, we have the UN Decade of Family Farming. So it has also seven pillars of development. So from seven to, I mean, from the Food System Summit, there are five action tracks, right? And here in the, in the UN Decade of Family Farming, we have the seven pillars. And another recommendation is, I mean, we need to make this platform to make a collective action. So we came from different backgrounds. We have different set of networks. So I mean, amplify the voices of our farmers. At the same time, educate our consumers. And lastly, we need to continue capacitating and organizing our farmers. So uh, that's why we organize Pamanaka because we need the second liners and the food producers. So we need the uh, we need to amplify and strengthen the role of, of our youth. So to answer the question, what is our understanding of, I mean, low tech and high tech? So coming from working with family farmer organization here in the Philippines, low tech, low tech means, I mean, in a conventional way of farming, I mean, subsistence farming. So that, I mean, it's an ongoing process from a, a smallholder farmer, from shift, from how to make from subsistence farming into agri-enterprise uh, development for them to to ensure really economic sustainability. And for the high-tech farming, I think in integration of accessible technologies that can be used and utilized by our food producers. So the challenge is how to make that accessible. At the same time, it does not make 
our producers inferior. It's not, I mean, it's not something that they can be af afraid of to use. So, I mean, there are many innovations, but that innovation should that compensate our environment, should that compensate the existing uh, cultural uh, practices, the traditional way of, I mean, looking up how they produce their, I mean, their food. That's all for me. Okay, thank you so much, Melissa. Um, I think, uh, yes, we covered everything, uh, uh, the low tech and high tech, uh, and uh, uh, everyone had a very interesting take on many subjects. Um, I'm gonna pass it to Fabini for the concluding remarks. Uh, Fabini, I think you're muted. Okay, typical problem. Okay, <laughs> sorry, I was just saying, uh, I just wanted to say thank you so much to our speakers who, you know, gave up your time to share some insightful knowledge and engage in this dialogue. I think this is a really important point, uh, part of like building um, solutions for a sustainable food system in the future, right? We need to engage, we need different stakeholders and people coming from different angles to have a conversation together. And I think this is a really fruitful discussion and, and we really see how we can really integrate both, you know, indigenous knowledge and farming techniques and we can couple that with technology to increase access to education to the farmers, get uh, farmers to access the market more easily. So, you know, at the end of the day, we, we really learn that there's no sides to this, but rather like one team, we all have to be one team working together getting um, the best parts of, you know, low tech systems and high tech systems to create this resilient, sustainable and inclusive food system that I believe we can create if we all work together. So thank you so much to our speakers who joined um, us today. Uh, thank you so much to Siani Youth, uh, Alice, who has uh, helped us you know, manage all the technical details of this so that we didn't completely mess up <laughs> and it ran really smoothly. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you to Sophia for spearheading this whole thing and putting it together. She was the one messaging all, us, all of us to make sure everything's on point. Um, and thank you so much, lastly, to everyone who joined and who's watching this live or not live. We hope that this event gave you some food for thought and thought for food. Um, and uh, you can see all our social media information on this slide if you wanna follow us. We're cool people and I'm sure that every one of us here is going to be doing something to create this, this future food system uh, that we want. So thank you and have a great rest of your day. <laughs>